Okay, um, apparently we're all ready to go. Um, so my name is Tony Birch. Um, I'm coming to you from downtown um, Carlton, the centre of the universe. And I'm here on behalf of the City of Melbourne um, conversation series. Um, before I start, I want to acknowledge that we're on Aboriginal land today, that we are on the land of the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people. Um, and of course, um, both nations are part of the greater Kulin nation. Um, we honour and respect um, those people. We respect their elders, past, present and emerging. And we understand that we're talking on Indigenous sovereign land and not a land owned by the occupier, um, White Australia. Um, this is an unusual event, I think, for all of us. Um, I've done the Melbourne Conversation Series events before, and we usually do them, obviously, in a physical space. Um, we do them um, often at BMW Edge Theatre at um, Federation Square or at somewhere at RMIT. And anyone who knows my um, talks or the way that I like to talk, I like to work the room very vigorously, so I, I tend to pace up and down. Um, so this is much more intimate. I'm upstairs locked in the bedroom. Um, I'm going to do it literally much more as an intimate um, conversation so that there are many of you apparently um, watching this, but I'm going to imagine that I'm, I'm talking to each of you in your or your bedrooms or your kitchens or your, where, wherever you are. So I want to be having a sort of a multiple one-on-one um, -on -one event. Um, and what we're going to do is going to be a real sort of show and tell conversation so that I'm going to talk about objects. I'm going to talk about objects in relationship to my own life and, and writing and talk about objects in a way other than simply um, a matter of yeah, finding stuff, picking it up and thinking of something to do with it. So I would say that the whole idea of objects have been central to my understanding and as a person and the relationship between objects and space, particularly objects and walking um, has been really important to me. So I'm going to do that in relationship to reading little segments of some of my fiction and non-fiction and then toward the end of the um, conversation, hopefully we'll have time for questions. So if you've got questions, please put them to us. If we don't get to the questions or we certainly don't get to enough questions in the in the one hour, I'd be quite happy. I'm, a, I'm on Facebook. So if you wanted to send me a Facebook message, even though you may not be my friend on Facebook, if you want to send a message, I'd be happy to um, answer those questions as well. Um, the way I want to start is to talk about the way that I've been a forager or someone who picks stuff up in the street out of necessity as a child and really not realising to until some point that there was stuff that I picked up that was more valuable than others, not in a material sense, and stuff that I started to keep. So I grew up in inner city Fitzroy in the 1960s and it was a very um, different time, certainly if you lived in the inner city, and Fitzroy was a very different place. Um, it was a very poor place to live, um, a very large, in a relative sense, Aboriginal population, a very large migrant population, and certainly a very large, poorer um, population generally of people. And because people had very little money, it's remarkable how much stuff that we found on the streets that, w that was of value. And the po a point to m mention here, when I first started to find stuff, it wasn't stuff that I was allowed to keep because it could be sold on, it could be used effectively, and therefore it, w it wasn't something you would keep. So initially it would be things like this, is that we never ever bought firewood. So that if we wanted wood for the fire and say we were coming home from school and you saw a long plank of wood in the gutter, you just knew instinctively to pick that up, go home, put it in the side yard, add it to the wood pile. So that we always gathered wood. Um, we would take um, one of the old baby prams. We used baby carriages a lot. We would take a baby carriage out into the street and we would walk the streets looking for scrap wood for the fire to take home. We would also... Um, do a lot of scrap metal so that me and my older brother we um were living in Fitzroy at the time that a lot of the houses were being demolished for what became the Afton Gardens Housing Commission estate and what happened there was that um as the houses were emptied out we would go into the houses climb onto the roofs and and acquire mostly lead but copper brass and we would sell that onto a a scrap metal dealer um in Brunswick Street and the other thing that often that we found is that by going into empty houses, uh, my mother and my aunties and my grandmother, they would find clothes that they could take home and wash that were, were good enough to, to sell on. So although I picked a lot of objects up as a kid, I actually didn't have any sort of sense of attachment to, the, to it. 
And if I did, um, my attachment to any object that was worth anything in a monetary sense or in the sense of looking after the family wasn't something that you could keep. Um, that all changed, I think, when I was in primary school and I was in, I think, about grade one or two. And only people as old as I am, I think, will remember this, but there was this sort of maths game, mathematics game, which evolved around a set of blocks, which were called air blocks. And they came in these enormous grey tubs and there were 10 compartments in the air set and they were literally numbered from 10 to 1. So the very small sort of dice-sized white um, blocks were equated to the number one and the very largest blocks I think were orange and they equated to the number 10. And of course what it meant if you lined up 10 of the um, dice blocks, the white box against one orange block, you would have you know, 10 times one equals 10, I think. And so these were objects that they looked beautiful, they felt beautiful, and they were something that I had this very strange attachment to, though I wasn't satisfied in having um, the ability to use the quiz in their blocks at school. So they weren't ours to own, they were kept at school. And I wanted them um, for myself and I wanted them in a much more um, certainly not to do mathematics. So I, I became really emotionally attached to the objects. So I started to steal them. So what I started to do was I would take a handful of blocks and put them in my, my school uniform pockets and I would take them home and I would get a spade and I would dig a hole in the back garden and I would hide the quiz in there, rods in the, um, in the garden. And then on weekends, I would dig them back up and play with them. As you can imagine, they got very dirty and grubby. It's sort of a bit like um, bringing up a corpse. So I would play with the rods. But what it was interesting, it's the first time, even though, you know, technically this was theft and I went to a Catholic school, it was there was something about the tactile nature of having those rods that 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 I felt these these are so important to me that I, that I had to steal them because my my mother certainly couldn't have afforded to to buy a set. Unfortunately one day a, a girl in class um saw me um putting the Cuisinaire rods into my pocket and and told the nun that I had stolen them. And I was humiliated by having to go home with two senior girls um, from grade six. I think I was in, as I said, about grade one. I had to go home, dig all of the Cuisinaire rods up in the backyard and then take them back to school and wash them and repaint them in the, the proper colour. What the nuns and the senior girls didn't know is that I actually made sure that there was one um, burial site that I did not excavate and in that burial site were two little red um, Cuisinaire rods which two little red is the number two for each of them so I had the equivalent of four numbers and I didn't dig those up and then what I did was when I went home that night I furiously dug those two red um, Cuisinaire rods up and I hid them in my room and I had them for many years so after we left Fitzroy moved house I would take those rods around with me now of course, when you've only got two rods in your hand, there's nothing you can do with them in regard to any sort of basic arithmetic. But it was the first time I felt really attached to something that held a story, that held sort of a sense of my identity and that that were mine. So what then I think is important for us to note here is that I lived at a time in Fitzroy when there was a lot of destruction. I mean, a lot of violent destruction. And it's interesting to consider because of that, why is it that you become attached to certain objects when there is enormous destruction occurring around them? So it's hard, I think, for people who haven't been through this to, to sort of get your head around or understand this. But one of the things that happened in Fitzroy in the 60s is that all of the houses that we occupied, so it's about 14 acres where the Housing Commission estate is in Fitzroy, all the houses, shops, factories, and a couple of pubs were completely demolished to build that estate. So when you're a child in coming home from school, you would actually see the physical destruction of houses where a relative may have lived, where a friend may have lived. And it was quite as a child disconcerting to go past my great grandmother's house where I'd, I'd sat in her kitchen, where I'd slept over, where I'd sat in the lounge room with my, all of my family and that, that, that family being shipped out, being forced out of that accommodation and then walking home from school and seeing a bulldozer literally destroy that house in a matter of minutes, a bulldozer could destroy a, a house in Fitzroy. And the impact that that had on me as a child was it actually enacted a sort of sense of violence in me regarding property. So in the about 1965, 66, when the last of the houses were being demolished, 
we as kids started to destroy our own houses so that we would be walking down the street and the house would have been emptied. And before the bulldozers arrived, we would go into the houses, we would smash all the windows, we would throw furniture out of a first floor window. And by the way, furniture that had been left behind, people just left Fitzroy and left all their stuff there. Um, kids set fire to houses and burnt them down. So it was akin in some ways, and I, I say this, um, with some sense of trepidation, but it was akin in some ways to living in a war zone when you're seeing all this destruction around you. So therefore your value of, of anything of material value just completely um, disappears. And to the point when we were leaving Fitzroy on August the 19th, 1966, there was a bit of a street party for the last of the people living on the street or living in those surrounding streets. And I still remember that our parents, my mother, they gave us, um, hammers, sledgehammers, crowbars, and basically said, you know, destroy what's left. So we're living in a house that's about to be bulldozed by the next week. And here we are as kids destroying the very houses that we'd loved and lived in um, for many years. So the effect on that, I think, is really dramatic because for a period of my life, and certainly after being forced out of that suburb where so many of my family had lived, I had a, a detachment that I didn't value place, I didn't value objects because everything that we had, had been um, taken from us. So what I wanna do now is give you some sense of that in relation to some of my writing. And I wanna start off by um, discussing and reading a very short piece out of my first book, Shadowboxing. So Shadowboxing is the probably the only, what I would call autobiographical fiction that I've done to any great extent. It was my first book. And part of that book is about the story of a, a boy called Michael, who is clearly a boy like me, and a boy leaving um, Fitzroy um, for the last time, and about the destructive nature of that leave, as I've just talked about in relationship to my own experience. What this scene is about, in fact, is about the boy's father, Mick, who is a, a quite a violent man, a very um, private man, a man who's been a, a boxer and a street fighter, who really only understands his life through acts of violence. And this is a scene in which um, the boy witnesses for the first time and only time in his father's life, a sense of an expression of something we might call love. And I'll give you the true story leading up to this very short scene and then I'll read it. So my father had been um, brought up in Young Street in Fitzroy. Um, he had been brought up in a house as the only male um, as a child and he lived with um, six women. He lived with his his two aunties, his mother, my grandmother, his 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 grandmother, my great grandmother, and two of his sisters. And he was quite a tender child, as uh, much as I, I I realize. And that after the destruction of his own house and after the 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 dispersal of his own family, he became a young man who was isolated and left on his own in the suburb of Fitzroy. We had a very old bent and sort of dented um, brass um, tea strainer in our house. And I never knew where it came from. And then one day when I was talking to my father, he told me a story about the tea strainer. But basically what had happened is after his childhood house had been bulldozed, my father had in fact walked up to the site where his house had stood and walked onto the site. And he talked about the anger of seeing the, the destruction of his childhood. And then when he was sort of kicking away a bit of rubble, he saw a brass tea strainer in the rubble. So I used that um, in my fiction to try and give some expression of value and love um, around a man who was otherwise a very violent and destructive person himself. So it's from um, a middle story in the book Shadowboxing. So there is my first book, Shadowboxing. Very good book, by the way. Um, and it's about... Um, this boy witnessing his father um, express love because of the story that is conjured out of this um, tea strainer. Katie, mum and I were at the table the next morning having breakfast when my dad came into the kitchen. He was hung over. He opened the back door and stuck his head under the tap over the gully trap. After dampening his hair, he scrubbed his face with ice cold water and put his mouth to the tap taking a long full drink. When he came back into the kitchen, he sat at the table and let the water run down his head of curls onto his bare shoulders and his chest. 
Without any need to be asked, Mum got up from the table to make him a cup of tea. He looked across to the sideboard at the brass tea strainer that had been found the night before. He leaned across and picked it up and studied it closely before placing it on the table. Who does this belong to? I was not sure he would even remember our meeting and conversation from the night before. I found it last night. It was there where your old place used to be, the one they knocked down yesterday. He ran a finger across the deep, deep gash on his palm, looking to it to return him to the previous night. He picked up the strainer again and held it in his hand. He commenced rubbing the brass between his thumb and forefinger. He looked down at the strainer as he spoke, more to himself than us. When I was a kid, he said, I lived in that house with my mum, my grandmother, two cousins and two aunties, six women, six beautiful women. We used to sit around the kitchen table of a night drinking cups of tea, listening to my granny tell us stories about the old days. He let out a sigh before continuing. That was a beautiful house. It was a house they knocked over. It was a house of love. When he looked up at us, we could see his eyes were full of tears. Mum was standing next to the table with a mug of tea in her hand. She was in shock. We all were. And not because my father was crying, but for the words he had spoken, a house of love. When he saw us looking at him, he threw the tea strainer onto the laminex tabletop, pushed his chair away from the table and left the room. A few minutes later, we heard the front door slam as he left the house. So... The first thing I suppose I'd want to say about objects is the way that not only do they hold stories, but you can conjure life, conjure story from objects. So what has happened to me since that time as a child is that I spent many years gathering stuff around me and not in necessarily in large volumes, although in a moment I'll show you a couple of instances of those, but it's usually an object that not only tells a story, but it tells a story that I need to hold on to. And it's, I think it's interesting that if I disposed of the object, so that tea strainer that I have just talked about, if we didn't have that tea strainer, we would still remember that story. We could still tell that story, but I firmly believe that the object and the story require each other or deserve each other. Or if yeah, we talk about respecting someone's story, I firmly believe that the object that is central to this story has to be respected as well. So I'm very much into the idea of, of, of holding on to those, those things that we love. And one of the things you might all want to consider, um, what are the, think about the objects that you love that do not have material value and why is it that you keep them? If you come from another country particularly, so if you're a first, second or third generation migrant, you will know that people who come or have to travel through four circumstances to another country often bring objects with them. And again, objects that don't have material value. It might be a cooking pot. It might be a piece of jewellery, although often the, the value of the jewellery is not monetary. It's more about a gift that may have been given to a person. It's because these objects allow us to contain the story that about where we've come from and where we're going to. So I want to move on to what I suppose we might call has become more of an obsession since I've become a writer, although I don't personally see it as an obsessive quality and what I've learned to do is to trust what I'm doing and I think I'll be able to explain that to you um, in various ways so the first thing I want to do is I want to I want to show you this piece of beach glass which a friend of mine recently sent me and this is really important because I want to go back to this because I'm in the I'm very much interested in the idea of how how our lives link and how seemingly coincidental um, forces in our life actually are, to me, not coincidental. So when my friend sent me this piece of beach glass, I understood it as having relevance to, to something that I'd been doing for a long time. And I felt a greater connection to that person because of it. So I want to show you something. So, so don't be afraid. I'm going to pick up this big vase. This is one of my collections of beach glass. I don't know how well it will come up on the screen. But this is full of beach glass that I've been collecting for many, many years. I, ha I have um, other containers of beach glass, uh, most of them bigger than that one. I've put, just put water on the computer, so let's hope we, we live. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about here is the, as a writer, 
to have faith in what I've been doing over the years in relationship to, to collecting and to understand that the collecting process when it begins is something of value to me. It's something of narrative value. It's something of emotional value and that I need to trust that without knowing what I'm doing. So let's just start with the, the beach glass. Now, I'm not the only collector of beach glass. Obviously, there are many people who collect beach glass. But what's interesting, I started to collect beach glass. And I remember the first time I did it, it was just a, you know, a pocket full of glass that I took home and wasn't sure even what to do with. But I realized very quickly there was something vital to doing this. There was something really important about doing this and that I was to take it seriously. So I didn't sort of then have sort of some formal um, program of an expedition down to a beach every weekend or something. But each time I went to a particular beach that I know outside Melbourne, I would go down there, which I still do. And I, I would collect um, beach from, from, sorry, collect glass from the beach and bring it home. And of course I ended up with these massive um, amounts of glass. Then what happened to me is that I had the experience of a loss in our family. And one of the things that I thought about, and this is going back some time now, is that I thought about it in relationship to the, um, the glass. And I thought about these many, many hundreds of beach glass that I had that each held its own story to consider who had picked those pieces up and which of those pieces belonged to people who were alive and people who had passed. And of course, I couldn't differentiate that. And there was something wonderful in a sense about that because when I looked at the um, beach glass in, in the bars um, covered with water, I knew that in that um, collection, there were pieces of glass that had been given to me by someone who had passed away, but those pieces of glass were now in life with the other pieces of glass that I'd collected or my children had collected. And then when I came to write um, a story collection, um, The Promise, in 2011, I was thinking of a man who was grieving for the loss of a child. And he was a man who sort of haunted his own house. Um, he couldn't go back to work. He feels very um, grieved about the loss of his son. And what he tries to do is recover traces of his son's life in that family house. And as part of that process, and as I was writing, I was thinking about what traces of a child might be left in a house after the child has passed, is that the whole notion of the beach glass came into play. So all of that collecting I'd been doing for probably 10 years until I wrote that story suddenly had another meaning. It was, it was central to this storytelling that the beach glass that I had been collecting had been collected for a purpose. And part of that purpose was to give a sense of love and to give an understanding of grieving that this man and, and this family were experiencing. So I'll read it and uh, I hope, no, I'm sure it'll, it'll be fairly self-explanatory. So it's about a guy who literally can't leave the house because he is experiencing um, so, uh, such a sense of, of grief. I spent the remainder of the morning on my daily mission, wandering the house, stopping now and then to look at a family photograph in the hallway or examine a smudge Vegemite fingerprint on a kitchen cupboard door and wonder which one of my children it belonged to. I ended my pilgrimage at the laundry doorway and studied the markings in the wooden frame where I'd recorded the heights of my children on the date of each of their birthdays. Taking my reading glasses out of my dressing gown pocket, I reread the measurements and dates several times before running my fingertips across the scars in the wood. I'd be exhausted by lunchtime and would find my way to Josh's room and his bed where I'd lie looking up at the fine web of cracks in the ceiling that had been there since we bought the house 14 years earlier. I'd never got around to repairing them. I never slept for long those afternoons, maybe an hour or so. After getting up to leave the bedroom, I'd look over my shoulder at the hollow I'd left behind. My days alone were occupied with the same activity, exploring the house, shuffling from room to room and rummaging through cupboards, bookshelves and storage boxes. Most of what I came across I'd already discovered weeks earlier until the morning I found the glass jar wedged between the back of the leather couch and the wall. I sat on the couch and nursed the jar in my arms. It was sealed tight after being filled with hundreds of pieces of beach glass and topped with seawater. Each piece of glass had been slowly worn smooth 
by sand and surf pounded in the rhythm of the sea. The jar was covered in a thick layer of dust. As I washed it in the kitchen sink, the colours and shapes of glass caught the sunlight streaming through the window. As I lifted the jar out of the soapy water and held it to the light, it slipped from my hands and smashed onto the kitchen floor, scattering brown, green and frosted pieces of glass across the tiles. On my hands and knees, I began separating out the smooth pieces of beach glass from the jagged remains of the jar. As the scent of the ocean wafted up, I thought about the family trips we'd made to the beach each summer and how the kids would compete to find the most valued pieces of glass, the rare blues and reds. The task of carefully sifting through the glass seemed overwhelming, demanding concentration, a skill I'd lost. Judging by the amount of dust caked on the jar, it must have been resting under the couch for some time. None of us had missed it. The easiest means of cleaning up was to tip the lot into the bin. The job would be over in minutes. Armed with a brush and pan from under the sink, I was about to sweep away the mess when a piece of glass caught my eye. Holding it between my finger and thumb, I thought about which one of the kids had collected it. Perhaps it was one of Emma's finds or even mine. I meticulously gathered each piece of glass in a colander, rinsed it under the sink tap and left it to drain in the sink. In the garden, I searched through the shed until I found a similar sized jar to the one I'd smashed. I cleaned it out, emptied the pieces of glass into the jar and filled it with water. As I was about to screw the lid down, I remembered something and added a couple of spoonfuls of sea salt for effect. Okay, so again, it's about having faith or value in what it is that you start to do. And although this is certainly not a, a writing workshop and we all work in idiosyncratic ways, I would say to any one of you who, who is a writer or, or thinking of writing that um, have faith in these, these obsessions that you have. Um, have faith in the fact that you might do something that seems a bit weird, but it's there for value later on and start to be, I suppose, a bit intuitive about um, what it is that you know you're doing. So before I move on back to this beautiful piece of glass is that it is relevant here because several weeks ago, um, I was at the Melbourne Cemetery visiting my grandmother's grave and I have beach glass in a small glass jar um, of my mother's grave and it had been smashed and I'm, I don't think anyone had done it untoward. I think it's probably a possum or a fox in the cemetery had knocked it. And I decided that I wouldn't keep the beach glass in the cemetery any longer. And I'd been for a run around Princess Park I, and people who know me know I'm a mad runner. And I put the beach glass in my pocket and I wasn't sure what to do with it. And then when I came home, um, I reflected on the fact of, of someone finding a piece of glass on another beach somewhere and thinking it was of value to me. And I thought at that moment, well, I need to reciprocate that value and return that. So I sent, um, the beach glass that I had to my friend. And I don't think, again, that these things are coincidental. They're about having particular connections to others through storytelling. And I think you really need to be, um, again, aware of that. The other obsession I had, and um, it relates to if people, if anyone's read my work, I have a really strong attachment to photographs, both taking photographs, which are, which are not that great. I take them for documentation for my writing, but I love reading photographs. I love looking at photographs. And the two issues around photographs I want to discuss um, briefly, one is similar to the issue that I've already raised, but one is also relevant to um, another issue around photographs that I think is really helpful for writers. So as well as um, collecting beach glass, um, and it's an interest I had for many years, is that I think I probably took about 500 photographs at Melbourne Cemetery or the Carlton Cemetery of the angels in the cemetery, the concrete angels. And one of the things you learn very quickly about the angels in the cemetery, there actually aren't that many different ones. There's probably five or six sort of prototypes. And you see after you've been looking around the cemetery a while that the same angel sort of pops up regularly. And many of the grave sites in Melbourne Cemetery, or some of them are, are really sort of badly knocked about. And some of these angels, they're, they're pockmarked. Um, they've lost bits and pieces of, of their wings. Um, they have cobwebs all over their face. And um, I had this idea that I would, would think of them as broken angels. And there was something, of course, quite poetically attractive with that. 
And so for many years, I would go to the cemetery at least a couple of weeks, go and see my grandmother and then walk around the cemetery and take these photographs. And, and one of the things that you find, by the way, is that once you photograph the same angel uh, 10 or 20 times, there's not much difference in those photographs. So you, you're not sure when you took them. Um, when I got to write um, my novel Blood, I think what was interesting, um, it was my first novel, is that I had a scene in the cemetery of two children, Jesse and Rachel. And again, um, when the children walked into the cemetery, I suddenly realized the angels are here. The broken angels that I've been photographed, they need to be here for these children. So I just want to read you a very brief scene which outlines that. So this is the two children in the cemetery. Some of the dead had been in the ground for more than a hundred years. I thought about what they might look like down there with all the flesh off them and no air and all the dirt on top of their coffins trapping them. There were no fresh flowers on any of the graves and the low iron picket fences around some of them had rusted away. Some of the headstones had toppled over like fallen buildings and were broken into pieces. Most of the stone statues standing over the graves were also broken. We talk, We walked by angels with busted wings and missing arms and legs. I stopped in front of one of the angels. He was offering me an open hand. The fingers on the hand were missing and his face had tiny holes all over it as if he had a disease. A large statue of Jesus Christ stood over the next grave. He had the same marks on his face and had a finger pointing to a place where his heart should have been but his heart was missing. It had been chiseled out and his chest had been stolen. Rachel was standing a few graves down from me, wiping the face of a small statue with her t-shirt. It was a girl with a pair of large wings sprouting out of her back. She wore a dress and her hands were held together in prayer. She looked sad. Rachel stepped onto the stone slab over the grave and stood next to the angel. I like this one, she said. She looks like me. Don't you think so, Jessie? I didn't think so, but said she did any, anyway, which made Rachel happy. So that's from blood. So the other thing about taking photographs that I think is really important is that when you take a photograph and you look at it many years later, what you realize that the, is that the photograph has changed. So an example of this would be if you take a photograph of your child as a four or five year old girl or boy, and then you look back at that photograph 10 years later, you see something in that child that you didn't see originally in the photograph. It's quite eerie because it's as if as the child grows and you know, your daughter or your son, their own identity, their personality, their emotions, their feelings emerge, you see those, um, those qualities um, emerging in a photograph that weren't there. So in a literal sense, that can't be possible, um, we know. Um, if anyone's interested in the history of photography, when, when photography was first invented, it was called the eye of history and the pencil of nature, meaning that it was irrefutable, that it couldn't change, that it was like a photocopy in a sense. And what we know s since then is, is the opposite. The photographs are endlessly interpretive. They are never static. Um, they always change. And again, as a writer, this has been really important to me because in some of my fiction, the relationship between people who are present and people who are absent really is understood through photography. And one of the things that, that again, we, we probably have no sense of this now where people who are operating digitally, many people who really only took holiday or family snaps may have had photo albums of those um, family photographs, or in the case of many people, and I know this is the case of a lot of Aboriginal people, really only had a shoebox in which when they moved around, they moved around with a shoebox full of family photographs. And one of the things that you find when people have lost loved ones, um, particularly um, people who have passed, but say again in relationship to Aboriginal people, this, the theft of children, um, the loss of relatives, and of course this broadens out to anyone's sense of loss, is that when people tell stories about those that they have lost, it's interesting that what happens is that they will often go to the photo album, they will often go to the shoebox and bring the photograph out as if to, to reiterate a story. So as a writer, I've been um, very interested in that process. So I just want to read, a, a again, a very short scene from my latest novel, The White Girl, which is about the, a photograph of um, a girl, Lilla, who has um, been missing 
um, for 12 years. Um, she's been missing from the family home. So she was a young girl of 16 when she left the family home and her own mother um, has not seen um, that girl since. So it is a, a, a wonderful um, way of understanding that sense of loss, but also, of course, the image of the missing girl at her age that she left, in a sense, in this case, haunting the very kitchen that her, her mother um, lives in. Odette looked into an empty cup of tea aware she'd momentarily been away. In spite of herself, she glanced at the framed photograph hanging on the wall above the stove, a portrait of her only child, Lilla. The photograph had been a gift for a daughter on her 16th birthday. Lilla had been pregnant at the time, a secret she'd managed to keep to herself until she was almost five months gone and could no longer hold her, hide her condition. Odette had initially dismissed her daughter's nausea as a symptom of fever common across the bitter winters in the district. They shared a bed and Odette savoured the closeness of her daughter's warmth until Lilla began turning her back and refusing her mother's comfort. It was only when Odette caught a glimpse of Lilla's swollen stomach through a crack in the bedroom door that her daughter's situation became apparent. When Odette confronted her, Lilla, Lilla hadn't bothered to cover her naked body. So what happens in that book is two things that I'd like to talk about briefly in relationship to um, photograph as objects of, of, that we, we retain. Um, in this case with Odette, particularly Lilla, her daughter, that, that photograph repeat, recurs many, many times in the book. And in fact, when Odette decides through four circumstances to leave her home, she takes the, the photograph with her. And one of the things I think that we need to think about in relationship to the photograph as, as a material object is that it is often the photograph of a loved one who we've, we've lost, who we've been separated from, that gives us, I suppose, the greatest sense of instability. So to look at the photograph of a child who has passed away or, or, or any other family member, it can be very disturbing, can be very upsetting, but to destroy that photograph or to not look at that photograph would be more disturbing. And I think it's interesting the way that people simply can't part um, with these images of loved ones, even though to look at those images can exacerbate um, someone's grief. The other issue I want to talk about in relationship to objects, re-photography and the experience of Aboriginal people that I used in this novel, it is a, a really terrible situation to consider that um, to this day there will be Aboriginal people, particularly older Aboriginal women, who will have photographs on their wall, um, in a photograph album, even perhaps in their bag, in their purse, of a child that um, they have never seen or have not seen for decades. It could be a, a young Aboriginal person carrying the photograph of a parent or a grandparent who they haven't seen for many decades because these are the people that they were removed from. These are the people that they were stolen from. And in the novel, um, Odette Brown, who is of course our, our key protagonist, she meets um, another Aboriginal woman, Dolores, who actually has lost her children or had them removed, forcibly removed from her from, by government. And after Dolores's own death, um, Odette inherits the photographs. She doesn't want the photographs. She doesn't know the woman that well. She's not family, but someone gives her the photographs because they're property that are left over after um, Dolores's death. And what happens with Odette? Initially, she literally refuses to take the photographs. She doesn't want them because what she knows is once she takes those objects, that she not only is responsible for the photographs, she is responsible for the missing children. So that it's really important to understand this in relationship to whether it be photographs or other objects, that the memories of Aboriginal children separated from family are carried in those objects and experiences. So many years ago, I published a poem called Away, and it was, again, using the notion of a child's foot, fingerprint left on a doorway, um, a rusting bicycle in a backyard. It was about photographs that Aboriginal people are left with memories of, of loved ones through objects, and they tend to carry these objects and retain them because I think in relationship to the photographs that Ojet is given by Dolores, to refuse the photographs and to not keep them, it is like death. It is disposing of the children. It's disposing of their memory. And Odette becomes, in a sense, initially 
the unwilling custodian of the lives of these two girls because their mother has passed. And toward the end of the book, I'm thankful that um, we find that Odette finds a way of finding a place for these children, of memorialising these children, of retaining the memory of these children. At a wider level, I, I think that, that there is a relative issue for all of us to consider. Um, it's, a, it's an issue in relationship to something bigger, of course, and that is the issue of colonial violence. And for people to know that um, when we think about violence against Indigenous people in Australia and globally in countries all over Australia, sorry, all over the world, is that the memory of these, this violence is often carried by Aboriginal people, carried by Indigenous people globally. And one of the things I've written about extensively and said many times is that what needs to happen is that the perpetrators of violence need to take ownership for these stories and these acts of violence to ease the burden, to take the burden away from from Indigenous people who are carrying um, the memories for the perpetrators of violence. So it's a very perverse and I think a very unjust situation to occur. And, and what's happening in the white girl is a version of that, although I, I tell it in a very, I suppose, intimate way through the relationship between two women, through the relationship of their um, fears for their children and the grief that they experience, both having lost daughters and through Odette becoming the, as I said, the custodian of knowledge. So I want to talk about a, a couple of other things and then um, we'll see if there are any questions. Um, so one of the things that I talked about is the relationship between um, my, what I would call my, my foraging practice and my, my walking practice. So um, I've been um, running for 40 years. I love running. Um, it's very th therapeutic for me. But I also love walking and of course when you walk you see stuff and on my walks um, I have seen a lot of stuff and I have collected a lot of stuff and annoyed people by bringing some of that stuff home um, but one of the things I started to do many many years ago was to collect these things pine cones now the point being you know I reckon all of you would agree that pine cone is not worth much in the material sense they're everywhere I don't know if you collect them. I know people collect pine cones for, for kindling. They burn very well in a fire. So the notion of collecting pine cones seems nonsensical, doesn't it? Because they're everywhere. It's not like they're rare objects and they're, and they're not worth anything. Um, I started to collect pine cones again, a bit of an unknown reason um, in regard to the way that I talked about glass, the way that I've talked about um, taking endless photographs and, and other forms of um, collecting I've done. And when I first started collecting pine cones, I was again, not, not aware of why I was doing it, but I just felt a need to do it. So my garden in my previous house, my garden in this house has pine cones scattered in the garden. There's bowls of pine cones inside the house. But it is interesting, the same way that I talked about this piece of glass being a connection to a friend of mine, it is really valuable to know that my grandson, Archie, who's 18 months old, he now comes into the house and the first thing he does is he plays with the pine cones. And I liked again that sort of that attachment. But the other thing about pine cones is that I started to understand their value oddly in relationship to people, in relationship to, to who I was, in relationship to, to my family. And this is a very small or a much smaller pine cone that I illegally brought into Australia from Kyoto in Japan. So if you're listening, Border Patrol, um, you can come and get me. Um, so this is, um, I brought home from Kyoto. And what I want to do now is read a, a small piece out of an essay I did for me, Anjan, last week, last year, sorry, which is about pine cones. And it is a piece of writing which is one of a series of essays that I've done, which are about the relationship between objects and grief. And in this case, in relationship um, to the death of my younger brother, Wayne, last year. Um, soon after my, bro my brother died, I had to make a decision if I would go to Japan for a climate justice conference. So my day job is in, in climate change stuff. And I, I wasn't sure if I would go. Um, I decided to go and I did find it very helpful. One is because I spent a lot of time on my own, which was actually quite good. I spent lots and lots of time walking, which was also quite good. And I was able to spend a lot of time dealing with my own relationship um, to my to my younger brother but the pine cones come into serious play here so i want to read this as well i started to walk many thousands of kilometers from westgate park i was in kyoto japan early on a friday morning 
The weather was crisp and clear and I chose to walk a quiet pathway beside a canal located below street level. I'd escaped the morning bustle about to kick off in the street above. I was on my second visit to a city I have since realized that I love. On previous mornings, my habit was to run the length of the canal pathway for about two kilometers before cutting through one of the city's many narrow streets toward the Imperial Palace Gardens. Negotiating a Kyoto back street is an exercise in cooperation. Barely able to accommodate the width of a single car, the street I run along accommodates drivers, cyclists, walkers, joggers, and small children on their way to school without the need of the blast of a car horn or an expletive. In the Imperial Gardens, I joined joggers, dog walkers, and meditators. On my final morning in Kyoto before returning home, I decided that I would not be running. I needed to walk quietly and slowly. One of my younger brothers had passed away suddenly two weeks before I left home for Japan, and I'd been thinking about him constantly. He had visited me in dreams in which he was youthful and happy. After arriving in Japan, I'd hiked into the mountains outside Tokyo, stopped at a temple and lit incense for him. Although the decision to be away from family immediately following my brother's death concerned me, Spending time with myself, walking through forests and beside water was emotionally restorative. Beginning my morning walk along the canal path in Kyoto, I passed several elderly people out walking. I saw no joggers. It seemed that everyone had decided that rather than pound the earth that morning, they would walk. Around the kilometer into the walk, I spotted a pine cone on the ground ahead of me and another, then another. I noticed six pine cones in all, loosely gathered together. They were smaller in size than the pine cones I collected at Princess Park. They were beautifully shaped and colored. I am one of six of my mother's children. My brother's death was a stark reminder that to a degree, we remain children always in the eyes of our mother. I stopped and looked down at the six cones, convinced that they had been waiting for me to pass by. I gathered them together and sat them on a bench. I studied each one and decided which pine cone represented me and which were my two sisters and three brothers, including my brother who had died. I rested five of the pine cones together in a garden bed above the bench and walked on with the sixth pine cone in the palm of my hand where it became my brother. Returning along the pathway around a half hour later, heading from my hotel to pack my suitcase for the flight home, I saw a young girl with an elderly man sitting on the same bench she was talking animatedly with the family of pine cones while the old man looked quietly up at the empty sky. My favorite filmmaker is the Japanese director Hirokazu Korida. His feature films include Afterlife, Nobody Knows, and the recent Shoplifters. A general critique of Korida is that his films highlight the value of being with the world rather than withdrawing from its challenges. In a time when we read about people experiencing climate grief, I believe it is vital that grief and mourning do not immobilize us. We must be proactive in tackling the violence enacted against the planet to be in the world together. I left Kyoto on the same morning as my final walk and Japan later that night. A cartel of one, I smuggled my contraband pine cone into Australia in a running sock Back home the following morning, I unpacked my suitcase and placed the pine cone, my brother, on the window ledge in the morning sun. And later that day, I sat on the couch and looked across the room at the pine cone. I stood and walked across the room, sat at my desk and began to write. Okay, so I was going to talk also about my love of a particular stone and read, but I won't, but I'll show you the stone. So that is a stone given to me by a dear friend, Kim Kruger, that belonged to her father who passed away last year. And she gave this stone to me at her father's funeral and, and said that I could keep it. And the two things that are remarkable, of course, it allows me to think of my friend, who's a remarkable woman, to think of her father. But it actually, again, this object taught me something. It taught me about this, its own strength and around the fragility of human society. Yeah, we think that we can control nature, we can control the planet, but we have none of the strength of this object. And it's a wonderful exercise in humility 
to be giving something like this and to be able to keep it and know that it is again this rock as an object is teaching me philosophically is teaching me politically um, each time that i hold it so what i'm going to do now it's 20 past so we have 10 minutes i have little idea of how to use any technology but it says chat so i'm going to see if the questions there come up okay they do okay all right so okay so we don't have any questions so we can do what we like okay so what i might do is read you that small segment from if you want to ask a question by the way there's still time so if you want to stick a question up there um we would get time i would just read you this small piece which is about um what i've talked about in relationship to the stone so you can get a sense of its value bear with me i have it here okay Following the burial at a local cemetery, we're invited back to the community hall where we enjoyed food and stories about the life of my friend's father. I noticed a wooden table where a range of items had been placed, books, hand tools, photographs, and other secondhand objects you might find at a garage sale. My friend took me over to the table and explained that each item had belonged to her father and held particular significance for him and his family. I was invited to choose an object and take it home with me as an act of commemoration. I hesitated. It didn't seem right that I should take something personal belonging to a man that I had hardly known. My friend gently nudged me. Go on, pick something, she said. My eye was drawn to an egg-shaped ivory-colored stone speckled with an earthy pigment. I picked the stone up. It sat full and heavy in the palm of my right hand. I turned it over. Its centre was smudged with a dark stain. It appeared that someone may have held the stone in their hand and rubbed it and rubbed it with the back of a thumb. Can I have this? I asked my friend. Of course, she answered. It's a good choice. The stone now sits on my writing desk. I often hold it in my hand when I'm thinking about words, the words I want to write as I am doing now. I have thought with the stone about life and death and my love for my friend who misses her father deeply. The stone has affected me, my thoughts on climate justice, which is a key area of my academic and community research. What I've come to understand about the stone is that it is stronger than me and you. It also is patient and thoughtful to an extent that human society appears to be incapable of. If we manage to destroy ourselves in the future and destroy non-human species and vital eco ecological systems in the process, it will be because we do not possess the humility and wisdom of the stone. Unfortunately, many in positions of power and influence appear most ill-equipped to recognize this. The stone has invited me to reflect on love and on death, including my own. The stone also reminds me that seemingly inanimate and soulless objects have guided me throughout my life, particularly when I am searching for understanding. Okay, so I'll just then conclude with a couple of comments. Um, I think that um, the end of that passage that I read is, is, is clearly relevant to, um, sorry, I, someone's asking a question, I think. Okay, someone's asked, has asked a question, so we'll see if we can find it. I'm really good at technology. Um, what I want to say in conclusion is that um, I state at the end of that piece that um, how much objects have guided me throughout my life, particularly when I'm searching for meaning. What I would suggest to, to people who have, who have listened in today is that um, be aware, I think, of the process of what I might call the gift of objects. So that when you think of children and the objects that they treasure, you know, we all know that old story, don't we? That um, um, when we give our kids, I remember my oldest daughter, Erin, who's um, 37, I think. Um, 
her first Christmas, um, she had too many presents because she was so spoiled being the first child. And she did that thing that her kids often do. She, um, she unwrapped a present. She picked up the cellophane paper and put it to her eyes and was mesmerized by that rose color each time she dropped the piece of cellophane paper and put it to her eyes again. So it's a really genuinely poetic moment where a child at that age doesn't understand material value. What she understands is poetry and wonder. And I think for each of us is that never, um, never feel embarrassed about that stuff that you want to keep that other people might think has no value or that maybe you know you should get rid of or that you've out, you're supposedly outgrown. You don't have to outgrow anything. You don't have to outgrow anything. And I think also that I'm really big on the whole notion of gift giving where people focus again on cost on on how much money you can spend. And I think when people offer a gift with thought, it is the case that its material value is completely irrelevant. People who have thought about a gift have obviously thought about a gift in relationship to the story of you. And um, I think we need to be generous in considering that. Now, probably there may be a question, but I'll have to put my glasses on to see this. So we do have two questions. So I'll address those and then we'll, I think we'll be, we'll be finishing. So we have a question from Deborah on Facebook. I wonder if that's my sister. Um, probably not. She calls herself Debbie. Um, so Deborah says, thank you, Tony. This is so inspiring. How would you describe the difference between writing about objects in fiction and writing about them in nonfiction? Or maybe is there a difference? That's a really great question. I think um, what I would say, um, Deborah, in this case, I think that the way that I've written about objects in nonfiction, in fact, has been, um, for want of a better word, more metaphysical. It's been more magical. So that when I've written about objects in nonfiction, it's because my um, attraction, my emotional state has felt really heightened. And when I've, um, so for instance, when I was given the stone, I knew that I wanted to write about it and I felt you know, really a tactile relationship to the stone. And I was really heightened, you know, when you're in a state of, um, I suppose, yeah, you're, the, the creative buzz is working, I suppose, what I would say is that, it is a form of magical thinking and it is a form, form of really sort of being emotionally involved with both the creative process and the object. I think when, um, it seems odd because when you're writing fiction, of course, you can do what you like. It's, you're given more freedom. When I write fiction and introduce objects, it's actually probably um, more sort of um, programmatic in the same way. So you've got to actually create the poetry around it. So um, I think that, your question really brings up the idea is that the, the way of um, my relationship with objects, by the way, is very similar to my relationship with place. Places that I've written about in nonfiction essays have been based on how I felt in the process of walking or running and wanting to retain that so that when I get back to my writing desk, I literally translate that experience. If I'm doing the same in fiction, it's sort of more, it's like it's after the event. So it's, it's a bit, it sounds odd, writing fiction is a bit, for me, it's a bit like more like doing the work than, than, than the creative nonfiction or, um, yeah. So we have another question from Rachel. This will be the last question and then we're going to say goodbye to each other. Did Tony mention where the last bit about the stone was published? I love to read it. No, Tony didn't mention that. Tony should have mentioned those. So both of these, um, the essay which has the walk in Kyoto um, and the other stuff is in Mianjin. So that's in Mianjin. And it's in Mianjin from summer 2019. So it actually came out in December 2019. So that's Mianjin. So that can be difficult to get. But the piece about um, the stone is about the brand new um, edition of Griffith Review. Um, this is Griffith Review 68 um, and it's subtitled um, getting on. We did a launch of this last night with Avid um, Books in um, in Brisbane, but there are also many, many great writers in this edition. Helen Garner, Andrew Stafford, um, Melanie Chung, Sam Wagan Watson, Charlotte Wood, Gabby Stroud, etc. And a lot of these essays are about um, ageing. Um, my essay is partly about ageing and partly about um, mortality but more about the process of someone at my age um, dealing with um, the issue of grief. Um, so I want to um, 
thank everyone for joining in today. It's almost half past one. And Rachel just said, Tony, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Rachel, for joining us. I don't know how many people there are, but I hope um, there are enough of you that um, we've been a bit of a crowd. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And as I said, if there are other people who want to ask questions and if it's just logistical about where do I find this essay or that essay or to think about other writers that you might follow up, I'd be quite happy for you to send a message to my Facebook uh, message or you can send a friend request and then I can send you the information and then you can unfriend me. I'm, I'm quite happy for you to do that as well. So um, I really appreciate people um, taking an hour to um, enjoy the conversation today. Um, I know it's a very odd time for everyone, so that um, I, I want to finish by saying I want to thank the City of Melbourne. I want to thank the Wurundjeri and um, Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation for allowing me to speak um, on country. And I want to thank everyone for listening. I really hope that everyone is safe. I hope we get back to a, a sort of normal life, but maybe with some changes in future. But um, I'm sure in a few months we'll be all out and about again. And um, if you happen to be in Melbourne and I run into you, please say hello. And if you're anywhere else in Australia, I, I hope you take care of yourselves and I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful um, rest of the year. So, so thank you very much. I'm going to go. Bye.